Hello and welcome to the How We Heal series. This is a series that's been put on by the Inner Arts Collective in collaboration with members who are different wellness practitioners specializing in a wide range of, um, of disciplines and services. Um, and our goal really with the How We Heal series is to target themes that are occurring uh, around the world um, to really support people through their experiences uh, with tools and strategies um, to be the best that they can be. So we invite panelists from different disciplines to, to shed different perspectives on the themes that emerge. We've talked about fear, anxiety, depression, um, ancestral healing. And today we're gonna to be speaking to attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADD and ADHD with Nina and Deb. Before we go into our introductions, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we're on. And, um, and also I would invite you all to, in the comment section, to enter the, the, the land that you are on. If there's any specific people that are from your area ancestrally or um, uh, like a tribe or an ind indigenous peoples, original peoples that you would like to acknowledge, you can just enter them in the chat box. Um, and I'll just begin with our, our land acknowledgement here. Um, here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, we acknowledge that we are on traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. So I'm just going to go into our, our comments box here. And see where you're all writing from. I don't see any comments. While those comments come in, um, I'd like us all to take a moment, just close your eyes and feel the land that you're on and give gratitude for the past that has brought us to this place today. Give gratitude to your ancestors. And take a moment to just really recognize and know that the work that we do here today with these conversations, not only does it build on the past, but it creates a better future for generations to come. And I give thanks to all of you for showing up for these conversations. Um, from Ariane and Jerry to everybody, Ojibwa near the Grand Bend, is, uh, they're honoring their ancestral land. Thank you, you guys. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Deb and Nina to introduce themselves, uh, a little bit about their background and what brings them to this conversation as, a, as an interest topic. All of our members, they volunteer for these topics. They're like, oh, I, want, I really wanna speak to that. So Deb and Nina um, uh, stepped forward. So, so Deb, would you mind getting started with just describing um, a little bit about yourself, your background professionally, personally, if, if that's relevant, and what brings you to the topic of ADD and ADHD? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, yes, my name is Deb Bertizan. Um, I'm a registered psychotherapist here in Ontario, and I hold an MA in child and youth care. Um, I've been in, in children's mental health for 34 or so years. And most of my time um, over that 34 years was spent working in a children's mental health center up in Aurora. Um, and I did various roles, including, um, well, I started in our children's residential program where kids lived there uh, five to seven days a week. Uh, sometimes went home on weekends to, to do some, um, some gradual getting back into their families. Um, group therapist, which is kind of my passion, 
Um, I also became a certified TheraPlay therapist while I was there. Um, I did family counseling. Um, and so most of my experience with uh, children and adults, uh, but mostly children and youth with ADHD and ADD came from uh, working in those roles. Um, and then later on, I did more of the supervising and training and, and program development. So I started developing children's groups based on all the groups that I had worked on uh, previous to that. And a lot of the kids that, that came to our groups um, did have ADD and ADHD. So I did children's groups. Um, I did parent groups, um, started developing my own parent training, um, like workshops. Um, and I also trained staff in trauma attachment and neurodevelopment. So the reason I kind of tell you how long I've been in the field is over that 34 years, we have learned so, so much. We learn so much more now about not only the brain, but also about um, really understanding children's behaviors. Um, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit more, but that's why it's really important to have a very nuanced approach to diagnosing ADD and ADHD. Um, and especially we know more about trauma and attachment and neurodevelopment. Um, and that's where sometimes misdiagnosis can come in. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and I guess currently, the last thing I'll say is I'm in private practice. Um, my specialty is working with young people between the ages of nine and 25 doing individual counseling, but I also do parent groups and parent workshops and training for practitioners, um, particularly around um, um, the attachment and neurodevelopment uh, and trauma, but also around self-regulation, which was kind of the area that I wrote about when, when I was doing my master's. And lastly, I, I, I work at, at Ryerson University three days a week at the School of Child and Youth Care. That's me. Okay. Thank you very much. Nina, would you mind um, introducing yourself? Absolutely. Thank you. So um, I'm, a, I'm a social worker in MSW with uh, 36 years in the field. Uh, I, I worked in addictions largely for uh, uh, many, many years and with gamblers for the last <clears throat> 20 years that I was, you know, working for somebody else for CAMH. Um, and uh, ADHD is very common in addiction, so it kept coming up uh, over and over. And it's particularly common in problem gamblers. So. Uh, there were themes going on in the people that we saw, a lot of ADHD, um, among other co-occurring co disorders. Um, and I began seeing the, the impact of, <clears throat> of these, of ADD, ADHD on, on self-esteem, on relationships, on the ability to, um, to work uh, and sustain a job, uh, to function, and... Uh, uh, and of course, the, the relationship with, with addictions. Um, and so I focused, you know, a lot on ADHD uh, and have focused on ADHD in my own private practice. Um, what I do is I work with individuals to help them learn new ways to, um, to manage the way they think. The way they think can work fine, it's just different, and they, they, they aren't the same as other people in terms of how they organize and make their day uh, uh, productive. And I also help them deal with the emotional impacts of the disorder. Uh, people who were only recently diagnosed, adults who were only recently diagnosed always have a history of <clears throat> just being told what to do uh, a lot and, and scolded a lot and um, really being given a lot of negative messages. Uh, and I also work with couples with ADHD, um, one or both partners, and helping them understand each other and work together instead of constantly being, you know, grappling and trying to make the other do what they wish. So that's, that's a, a rundown on me. Thank you, Nina. 
You're welcome. So collectively between Nina and Deb, guys, just so you have an understanding, we're, we're deal they're dealing with like 30 years plus experience each. So it's a, it, this is a really unique quality in, in, in our panel discussions. We've never had this, um, this kind of background present in our panelists. So I really encourage you, if you have any uh, questions, to please, please put them in the comment box. And um, if you do need to discuss with them privately, um, afterwards, we'll make their contact information available so that you can uh, definitely get the resources and the support that you need. Um, so, to, but to get started, just to lay the foundation so we're all on the same page, um, Deb and Nina, would you mind please describing um, what is ADD, ADHD, the similarities and the differences, just so we're, so we're all really quite clear. Um. Go ahead, Nina. Okay. Uh, ADD uh, is just attention deficit disorder without hyperactivity, and ADHD has the hyperactivity. So it's one of two kinds of, of this disorder. Um, people, um, say kids who have just ADD, are more likely to be the space cadets, the ones that are not paying attention, but they're not disruptive. They're looking out the window, they're, you know, they're just not paying attention. Um, whereas the kids that have the hyperactivity are more likely to be disruptive, up moving, talking, um, you know, just restless. Uh, and in adults, <clears throat> that's not quite so, you know, prominent, but you still see people who are easily, uh, it's hard for them to sit still. Uh, and they, they, their, their attention span isn't that long. Deb, do you have anything to add? Well, I would add that just, you know, historically, like I would say in the, uh, in the 70s, it wasn't really until the late 70s and 80s that they, they separated the two. Mm -hmm. um, they used to only really recognize kids that um, had that hyperactivity and poor impulse control. And mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, at one point they were looking at, it, they, they would kind of call it hyper Connecticut uh, uh, disorders. And then they started realizing that there was, the, and, and they focused at that time just so much on the behaviors. Um, they saw these kids as defiant and really had a lack of understanding. Um, and then I would say late 70s, early 80s was when um, they started really understanding um, that there was this whole area of executive functioning, um, including this inattention and, and, and uh, lack of motivation and, and impulse control issues, trouble focusing, trouble with, with memory, that was all involved. Um, and so they had missed this huge piece. Um, and I think that that's where we just started moving to the place that we are now. And that's why the H was uh, yeah. ADHD and ADD. And, and one of the uh, um, consequences of them missing that big piece was that they missed a lot of girls and women with ADHD because they were not, they didn't happen to be hyperactive and they were not uh, causing trouble. They were just disappearing. Right. So um, I'm going to just profess complete ignorance with ADD and ADHD. I have a lot of friends that have said they have ADD or ADHD and um, have worked with colleagues and have met parents and children. And um, there's a lot of like differences and opinions around, is it just a hyper child, which is totally normal, or is it ADD or ADHD? And like this overdiagnosis, misdiagnosis mm. sort of situation happening. Mm. Um, so I, I know with with and I do think that our next question will will kind of get on that a little bit. Um, but in previous conversations with you guys in preparing for this panel, we we talked about how well you shared with me how frequently ADD and ADHD is is either misdiagnosed or it's co-occurring with other other issues and other disorders or you know and I just w I would love for you to share your experience with with the audience and the, the listeners here today about your, your experience with misdiagnosis and also with concurrent uh, co-occurring issues happening um, mm -hmm. for, for people that have ADD or ADHD or not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, you, you want to go ahead. now or, okay. No, I think, I think you're, you've got the, the broader perspective. Yeah, it was interesting children. because I think, um, you know, when Nina and I were talking, I, I, 
over my career, because I work with children, saw more misdiagnosis. Um, you know, I said earlier that we didn't know as much about the brain as we know now. Um, and part of that is now that we know when we look through a trauma or an attachment lens, um, often those children are misdiagnosed. So um, what happens is, is kids who have experienced trauma, that impacts their neurodevelopment. So you're going to see things like fight, flight, or freeze behaviors much more often, and it's not ADD. It just means they're hyper aroused, which is like really speedy and um, you know impulsive and often very anxious looking, um, but also looks like ADD or hypo aroused, which is um, looking more depressed and and more um, down, which can also look like ADD. So, so we now know that there really needs to be a much more nuanced approach, as I said earlier, to the diagnose, the, the diagnosis, because there's there's a thing called comorbidity, and that is kind of like what what Nina was talking about, where there's overlapping um, diagnoses, um, and it, it it all happens at the same time. So often, what you'll see with folks that have ADD and ADHD. Um, including children, but particularly as they get older, if it's missed, is you'll see things like anxiety, depression. I think there's something like 50% will have learning disabilities. Um, things like um, Tourette's or any tic disorder. Um, what else? Um, uh, conduct issues. So, and again, you know, uh, as a child and youth practitioner, I, I've moved more away from a medical model, but I do understand that that real ADHD is a medical issue. But I, I, mm -hmm. I have a have a lot of issues with the DSM, the diagnostical uh, models. But I will use those terms. So um, you know things like conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. So all these things that we're seeing in children all at the same time um, can happen while they have ADHD. Um, and that's why going to see a practitioner who really knows how to do a good diagnosis, and we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later, um, that's really important. Um, also, ASD or autism spectrum <laughs> disorder, we're seeing more of that, um, and ADA at the same time. So it is hard to really kind of parcel it out. Mm -hmm. um, but when the, sorry. the last thing I'll say is, 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 is at the beginning, in the when uh, everybody was like, oh, ADD, ADD, what was happening is there was a lot of misdiagnosis. And we had a lot of teachers and parents that were just hearing about this thing. It's like, oh, is that, oh, yeah, my kid's like that. Oh, maybe I'm like that. Um, and, and a lot of doctors, because it was new, they were making this diagnosis, a uh, diagnosis. But we know so much more now. Um, mm -hmm. And um, especially when there are kids of trauma, we didn't know a lot about that um, back then. Sorry, go ahead, Nina. What, what I see with adults is the misdiagnosis that, as in that it was missed, um, or it was identified but never really treated. So you get um, adults who've, as I said, spent their, you know, their whole um, upbringing feeling like they weren't good enough, like they had done, they, they, they just couldn't do the same things other people could do easily. They had to work, you know, five times as hard in order to complete their homework because they couldn't concentrate. And it was them that was wrong. There was something wrong with them, you know, with their willpower or something. Uh, it, it was not uh, put in that context. I mean, the thing about this disorder is that it's not visible. And so and people can look just fine and if they happen to focus they can do just fine so it's very easy for it to be under recognized um, yes it's been over recognized uh, in, in you know in sometimes in places what I end up seeing is the people who are under recognized mm -hmm. and really suffered as a result mm -hmm. and, and to add to that I would say yeah by the time these these uh, young ones get to adolescence uh, in their classroom, they have, you know, been again misunderstood, been seen as defiant, lazy, all these myths about about these kids, and their self esteem is really bad, mm -hmm. and their social skills are really poor. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that moving into ad adolescence leads to other problems like the anxiety, depression, um, substance use, Nina, you know all about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is why it is really um, important to be able to, to um, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, but decipher what's what and, and have a really good practitioner who's making a diagnosis. I'm just wondering whether everybody is familiar with the basics um, of what ADHD is and you know what it emerges from. Right. Do people need a, any kind of rundown on that or is that too basic? How are you guys feeling? Thumbs up if you have the basics. Yeah, okay. Okay. We have a question here from Terry Guys that I'd really like to zone in on to support mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. um, and this might be more directed to you, um, Deb. Mm -hmm. um, she's looking for some effective in the moment strategies to help youth during emotional dysregulation episodes. Example, risk of self-harm. Okay, so into, that's, a, that's a loaded question and a great question. Thank you for that, Terry. Um, self-harm is a really interesting um, uh, phenomena almost that we're seeing now. Um, a lot of youth, youth are participating in self-harm. Now, there's a difference if someone has ADD or ADHD, or if they're coming from a different background, if this is because they can't handle their anxiety and there's not the ADHD, um, if they come from a trauma background. Um, and the reason I say that is if they have ADHD um, and a, a, a relatively severe case, um, typically they require medication to help with it because it is a, a chemical imbalance. Um, so that is helpful, but pills don't necessarily teach skills, right? So when kids are on medication, we really want to be doing counseling and coaching and all of that kind of stuff as well. Um, so it, it, it's a combination. So if they have ADHD, and Terry, I'm not sure if, if the person you're thinking about has ADHD, um, yes, Okay, so, so what happens is medication is useful as well. And that can take a long time to figure out which med. I'm not a doctor and I don't wanna start um, pretending that I know about that. I mean, I know what I've seen, um, but often it takes a long time to figure out exactly which medication makes sense because of that comorbidity, because they may have anxiety, depression and all of those stuff. Okay, now fast forward to uh, that self-regulation piece. If they're on medication, because often pre-medication, we try to do a lot of coaching with young people and we try to um, teach them uh, certain skills, including self-regulation, and we're just going, well, oh, it's just not sticking. And that's sometimes how we know that it actually is ADHD, that, that we've really kind of tried to do that work and, and, and it, they just kind of weren't getting it. So that nice combination of medication and then teaching them about, first it's about recognizing what happens within their bodies. That's, that's the way you start. So getting young people or adults for that matter to know when they're becoming dysregulated. And by dysregulated, I mean becoming kind of more like out of this zone where they can think clearly and more either hyper or hypo. Um, and to be able to catch themselves. So it might be for me, um, my toe starts tapping, everybody's heart starts racing more, you can't think clearly, your muscles tense, your shoulders go up. All of those things, it takes a lot of practice to recognize so that you can catch yourself. And then you start doing things to kind of ground yourself and to calm yourself. I don't want to take too much time about this, but the thing that with, with self-harm is um, and high-risk behavior is, um, and I know this because I, 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 um, I, I, was, I used to work at, at Skylark at their, their walk-in clinic, and we saw every night we would see self-harming uh, young people. Um, and it's, it's more common. So what we want to find out is 
of course we don't want kids to be self-harming but it's more common they have things like cutting clubs now and and uh, i mean you can look up how to self-harm without killing yourself but what you need to be able to distinguish is is there suicidal ideation there do they want to be dead or do they just want to numb that the, the pain that they're feeling and a lot of kids with adhd because of that those self-esteem issues really really do suffer they're embarrassed they're frustrated with their ability. So what we want to be able to teach them is alternatives to figure out, and I'm pointing to my arm because that's just a typical one is, is cutting on the arms, um, is alternatives to recognize, can they hold off for five minutes? Is there another way, something else that they can do to self-soothe um, or recognize when they're moving into that state? It's a really long answer and a little complicated, um, but that's, that's, I'm just giving you some really brief points. I don't know, was that useful? Good, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, when you guys were talking about medication, we had another question come in from uh, Ariane and Jerry, um, and it was around non-pharmaceutical medication like essential oils or homeopathy, and if you guys have had any experience working with these modalities or 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 hearing about people working with these modalities and then them helping no i haven't no with them working listen i again in working with kids of course most parents don't want to put their kids on drugs that's uh so they try a lot of these things first and i think even um when you're going to get a diagnosis um you want to have kind of experimented with things I have, I personally, uh, with the young people that I worked with, similar to Nina, haven't found um, that they are effective in the same way that medications are. Um, they can be useful. That doesn't mean, um, I, I know parents will really watch their children's diets um, to see. That's as any parent would do with any child that would have a food sensitivity and may react. Um, so there are certain things that may be useful. Um, again, there's that thing, ADHD, or is it anxiety? If, it's, if you're purely dealing with anxiety, and let's just say you're on meds, but if it's just, just anxiety, period, um, there are certain things like um, uh, the smell of lavender, uh, citrus. What we know about that is that it, for some reason, lowers cortisol, which contributes to, to anxiety. But to deal with ADHD itself, and again, I'm not a doctor, nor am I a homeopath, um, they may also have had better experiences with it. Um, but um, I haven't heard that it, it really uh, deals with that chemical thing that's going on in the brain. ADHD happens in utero. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a lesion in the prefrontal cortex. Um, so, I, I, you know, the need to say, no, I'm not sure. There could be, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, theories out there about what's involved. Yeah. Feel free. Um, but I, so, yeah, I don't know. I wish we had a homeopath on the line. Yeah. I, I, I just say what I understood is that it's very highly genetic and it does run in families. There's no yeah. question. Uh, and um, there are a number of genes that are involved. So people can have anywhere from, I think it, five is the last number I heard, but I could be out of date. Um, you know, any, you could have anywhere from one gene and just be a little bit talkative uh, to five and be so um, affected by it that you just can't function. So, you know, it, it, it varies a lot, uh, the severity according to which genes and the number of genes involved. Mm. But as you, as you mentioned, Deb, a lot of parents find out they have it by watching, by dealing with their children and saying, well, yeah, but that's just like me. Uh, maybe I have it too. Hmm. Hmm. And actually, we, we did have a, homeop uh, a homeopath that was scheduled to join us today, Joy Burlton, mm. but um, she is exceedingly busy right now with... Um, mm -hmm. A number of things going on in life as as is happening to many people and had to uh, decline joining today's panel so uh, I would suggest if you're looking for um, homeopathic advice 
obviously she was interested in the panel enough to initially sign up for this conversation. So I would I would suggest her, Joy, Joy Burlton. She may have had some success that we don't know about. Yeah, especially in dealing with, like you were suggesting, um, the the other issues like such as anxiety or other other things, other symptoms mm -hmm. or experiences, mm -hmm. you know, to, mm -hmm. I know one of my friends also has anxiety and ADD, ADD and um, he takes the chill pill and he loves it. It's from the health food store. It calms him right down. It, mm. it doesn't totally help with sleep, but it, it does help a little bit. Mm. And um, he's, he's loved it. So <laughs> it's like, he can he can handle he with coping strategies he can handle the other symptoms and with supports around him like friends and family but um that uh just lowers the anxiety a bit mm -hmm. for him that and and again that's the key that. never ever meds on its own you know some people think then you're then great now and 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 on all of these things don't um they don't heal it doesn't take it away it helps you you manage what's going on Right. So, um, so really still there's a whole skill building and um, that has to happen as well. Yeah, thank you. So at what point should somebody get professional help? Like what, what do you guys suggest in terms of, you know, some hallmark signs that people should be looking for before they reach out for some professional help? I think that, that uh, children need help really early, uh, you know, as early as it's identified just because there's so much negativity in the family and at school until they are um, on, on identified and, and, and assisted, usually on meds one way or the other. Deb, what about you? Oh, I 100% agree with you. Um, if you can catch it early, especially because of that comorbidity piece and, and, and where it can move to if undetected, the thing is, is that um, if you get to it early, it, you know, they're not going to have that rough self-esteem stuff that's going on. They're not going to have all that, you know, the mm -hmm. embarrassment of not being able to do the, the social skills well. In school, it's really rough for kids with ADHD if their um, teachers don't understand what it is. Mm -hmm. um, they, they think it's, 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 it's defiance and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So early, early, early detection um, and um, and then coaching with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't think that teachers, even when they even when they know somebody has ADHD, uh, are necessarily <clears throat> really paying attention. I have a client who said he he finally was he was having a hard time. He finally went to his high school teacher to to um, say he you know he's having difficulties around ADHD. And this was because they'd been talking about ADHD in class. Mm -hmm. And he said this to her and she said, now don't use it as an excuse. Oh. Oh. But he's never, he's never actually gotten over that. He's still angry years later um, because it was just so dismissive. Yeah, well, that's a shame. Mm -hmm. It's a big myth too, that people use it as an excuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and what about adults? Like, um, you know, certainly children, uh, but what about adults? Like if you've been working through this for a really long time and you're like, you know, I'm 40, what's the point? Um, what, what do you say, what, what are some of the, the signs that you should look for before you get professional help? Well, usually people are noticing, um, Somebody sometimes says to them, have you thought maybe you've got ADHD? Right. <clears throat> I've got one couple where it was the partner who said, maybe you should look into this. Um, so, you know, it, 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 there's that. Some people come to it because they realize how much trouble they're having concentrating at work. Uh, sometimes it's because their children are diagnosed. Um, but I think that, that what people are, are looking out for, discovering, um, are some of the, you know, the basic symptoms. They forget things all the time. Um, they act impulsively. Uh, you know, they, their, their emotions are all over the place. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they don't seem to be able to uh, operate as effectively as other people, even though they're smart, even though they're very capable. So that's one of the possibilities that starts to come up that they, that they want to look into.
Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, but before I ask one, I just have a recommendation from Terry. She had said homeopathic remedies have been way better than CBD, CBD oil for, for her family member mm -hmm. um, who self harms. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, CBD. Yeah, CBD. Is, yeah, you really have to be able to find the right, like it's, it's uh, very precise uh, that. Um, for, for using that. And again, that's for anxiety as well. So um, yeah, really kind of distinguishing. Thing is, is if you're on um, meds for ADHD, um, and this is what, I have no idea how to address this because I'm not um, a medical practitioner, but what I always say, you know, a lot of, of kids and youth who have ADHD and don't want to go on say Ritalin or Concerta, um, they'll self-medicate. Um, like with mm. weed, of course, is, is legal here. And, um, but um, they're also taking medications maybe for anxiety and for other things. And I really ask them to tell their doctors, you know, so that they can find that right balance. And, and um, you know, self-medicating is one thing, but when you're mixing them, you really want to uh, know what's, and taking the shame out of weed uses, mm -hmm. using really, so that you can, you um, Make sure that you're using a, a good blend if that's if that's what uh, what what will help. Okay, thank you. I have a, a question from one of our um, participants who prefers to stay anonymous. Um, I'll just read it verbatim. Mm -hmm. Could difficulties with switching attention be related to this disorder? It feels like I need a long time to react the same way, and I think through things the same way as others but I can't think, make sense, react and correspond and remember at the same time. It feels frustrating and humiliating that the answer could be, I don't have it. And I just lack this capacity. Does that sound uh, that those are some of the symptoms of ADD and AD or ADHD? Um, switching attention. Um, so not, not being able- time Thinking, making sense, reacting, corresponding remembering. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's sometimes the case, particularly when somebody is um, also anxious uh, or trying to manage uh, emotions and thoughts and put them all together quickly enough to say, respond to a question or, a you know. Uh, so yes, that can happen. Um, it's not necessarily ADHD, but it could be. Um, it, it, you know, I'd, I'd want to do a lot more sort of exploration to get a sense of what, a, what, what that happens with and what happens around it in order to understand it better before I gave any kind of definitive answer. Yeah, I would say exactly the same thing, which is why, um, you know, when you're seeking a practitioner or a diagnostician, um, you really want to make sure that they do a very thorough history so that, that you know how long it's been this way. Is there anything that, that kind of, you could be grieving for that matter. And absolutely everything that you mentioned um, mm -hmm. is, is, nat is, is a natural outcome. So this may be short term, mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, I, I really go back to, is there trauma or attachment injury in, in, uh, in your background? Um, because if that's the case, um, that can be not ADHD, but that just can be what has happened in your neurodevelopment. And that can be worked on with self-regulation. Um, so yes, it could be. I'm, 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 Nina and I are, are in agreement on this one. It could be. It might not be. I'll just throw in that another place that I tend to go back to is, are you eating enough? Are you sleeping well? Um, you know, because it can be temporary around that as well, that the, the number of people who are really struggling, um, and if you just ask, you know, the, those kind of basic questions about nutrition and sleep, you find out that it's a miracle they're on their feet in the first place because they haven't slept a full night for years, you know, and of course they can't think straight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
That's a really good point, Nina. Um, you know, if, if when you're taking your children in to, to see somebody to get uh, tested, I always say, before you do that, do things like journaling. Journal like at times of the day that you notice certain behaviors or mm -hmm. certain distractions. Um, you know, are, are they hungry? Um, is there a problem with your hearing? Uh, you know, there are all these things or that, they're hearing. yeah, or they're hearing, right? Yeah. So all of these things that, that, um, is really what a, a good practitioner is going to do in their assessment. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's important to look, um, overall. So again, for young people, it might be, they have this issue at school, but they don't necessarily have it at home. Well, is there something going on at school too? Mm -hmm. Um, exactly. So it really is kind of me, you know, what I might recommend is, is just starting to notice pattern. And, yes. and if you're looking at yourself, journal your own behaviors. And when you're having, when you find um, you're having trouble that your, your thoughts are about my thoughts bounce all the time. I, you know, um, yeah, time of day, day of the week. Um, very important. Who's around what's going on around you. Uh, what was the last night? Like, yeah, all of that. And I think it's very important for people to eliminate any medical issues, um, you know, and, and think about the physical before jumping to the psychological, because there are some really uh, major impacts that, that, you know, these things can have on, on, on the mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you said, uh, you know, who's around, um, it's, it's, it's also important to learn about what your triggers are. Um, and by that, I mean, what are the things that set you off um, into maybe, um, and this is typically anxiety or um, things like that, but it can also work for with ADD. So what are the things that you know um, tend to make you more hypo or hyper, sorry, hyper or hypo? Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, what, what overwhelms you? When is it that you go into fight, flight, or freeze? What are those mm -hmm. things that set you off? Are they people? Are they a certain facial expression? Are mm -hmm. they, these are all great things to be journaling, to, that, that mm -hmm. self-awareness. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that's helpful for you. Um, I would just encourage the participant, you can message me privately. I sent you a private message there just to see how you're feeling about that. Um, I have another question here from another anonymous. Um, sometimes I feel like my friend uh, says that they've used ADD as an excuse for being lazy, scattered, and not following through with their promises. I don't feel like they've ever even been officially diagnosed, so it's hard to take them seriously. How can I be a supportive friend and encourage them to find more order in their life? Hmm. Well, um, <laughs> did you want to? Sure, and then I'm sure you'll add to it too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, well, anonymous, you're not alone. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I think that that this is very, very common. Um, and, but there is a laziness myth attached to ADD, um, whether they've been diagnosed um, or not. Um, in terms of your friendship, may not make um, a difference. I mean, the first thing that I would say is try to approach this um, with as little judgment as possible. They've got that covered. I got to tell you, most people that, that have this are really judgmental of themselves. They're embarrassed. Um, so I think approaching it really, really gently and supportively. I think if they're your friend, ask them. Ask them what, what, can, um, what you can do to, to help. Um, and always do things with permission. Um, you know, if it is that they need you to help organize their kitchen or um, organize their house, I mean, ask them that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had, I had a friend with, with ADD and she always said, don't touch my stuff. You know, so here we are, we're all camping and we all just, we're all packed and we're all just waiting and there's Jane with her <laughs> tent still up and, you know, but we just waited because, you know, she said, don't touch my stuff. Yeah. So cool. That's great. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I do think it's also just keep that communication open um, because there's, there is the other side of it as I have a friend with ADHD who is chronically late. 
And I have to say, look, and I know it's frustrating for you, but when I come to pick you up and you're never, ever ready on time, how, how can we deal with this? Like, I know it frustrates you, but this is something that kind of um, bothers me too. So at least it's on their radar. So they know, oh my God, Deb's going to freak out if I'm late. Um, but it's on their radar that it's something, and this is, this is it, it's, it's just a friendship communication relational way of doing it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm as patient as I can be, but I want them to know that, that this kind of bugs me too. And, you know. I, I, I know of one young woman whose uh, friends, I think her, her friends probably told her an earlier time than everybody else, uh, mm -hmm. just so that she'd get there on time because she consistently left um, uh, at, at, at pretty much the time where she should have been there. That, mm -hmm. was, that was always the, the gap. Mm -hmm. um, people with ADHD can be exasperating. There's no question about it. And when, I, when I'm working with somebody with ADHD, I'm, I'm asking them, well, any client really, I'm saying, if you need help, take charge of asking for that help. Um, you know, you be the one to say, could you help me with X? And then you're in charge and it, you don't feel infantilized. Mm. Um, when, it's, when it's friends and family, you're right. The most effective thing is straight, straightforward communication. Um, interestingly, a lot of the time people um, with ADHD don't mind being told something that everybody else is tiptoeing around them, you know, and saying, Oh, you know, stop, please stop, please stop, you know, stop talking, stop talking. But they, but they nod politely, et cetera, et cetera. And really, the person with ADHD might be fine with you saying, enough, stop. Okay, let somebody else talk. Oh, okay, you know, that's fine. So straight conversations are huge. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. I'm just seeing your text, Melanie. Yeah, so I can't believe we're already in our last... Um five minutes now. I have one more question for you guys and, and then I would like to invite the audience to share any strategies or comments that they might have um, with, with everybody because there's a lot of wisdom in the room right now. Mm -hmm. um, so our last question is from Joe. He's from Italy and, and although you know we're writing from we're, we're here in Canada right now there might be some tools and suggestions that you have for Joe. Um, I'm an employer and I have a couple of staff members with ADD or ADHD. What tools, training, or strategies would you recommend for employers to best support their staff while also making sure their responsibilities are fulfilled? Mm. I'm, I'm, I've really got, uh, it, you know, this comes up a lot with adults, you know, is accommodations in the workplace. What seems to be effective is for the boss and the employee to sit down and, and look at what, uh, how, how the person with the ADHD works best. Um, a lot of it is around um, specific goals, schedules, uh, you know, specific expectations that are broken down into pieces with, you know, because long deadlines are hard, um, short deadlines are much easier. Uh, so, you know, and, and reducing distractions, the open workplace thing can be quite hard um, because people are easily distracted by somebody else's phone call or whatever. So, you know, is there some space they can go to when they really need to focus? Um, there are a lot of techniques and strategies that, that uh, and, it's, and it's terrific that Joe wants to, to help um, people rather than giving them a hard time <laughs> because that's great. Mm -hmm. I had, I had, by the way, one client who was supposed to, she was training on, um, I can't remember the details, but she was training and she was supposed to complete five uh, files a day. And she got over-focused and she was doing over a hundred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just, really, you know, but, you know, it was just, it was throwing everybody for a loop. It was great, but not really, you know. So things like that have to be processed. Otherwise, they just look weird. Thank you. I think, I think Nina's covered it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, thank you guys so much. So there's, there's clearly been um, a very active um, uh, group here. I just have a message here. Uh, one sec, sorry. 
Okay. Okay. Um, the issue with the person that wasn't sure if she, if, if they had ADD or ADHD, um, is the assessment cost. And yeah. uh, they don't want to be a burden on their family. No. Um, and they're just wondering if it's like a way of life and if they have any, any specialist recommendations for how to, how to afford, um, the assessment cost. Wait, yes. how, much, how much is it? If, 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 if you're doing it privately, thousands. say that again, Nina. It can run into thousands if you if you go to a to a clinic, yeah. um, an ADHD clinic. Um, but the psychiatrist mm -hmm. should not cost anything. Uh, you know that would be covered. So sometimes you can find help through a psychiatrist. Um, sometimes uh, a family doctor will you know do a screener, say, well, why don't we just try um, some medication, see if that helps, and that's as far as it goes. But it's better than nothing. Uh, no, it's it's a tough one. Mm. Well, and this person is a is an adult, so I mean, if it, for children, often you can get the ball rolling through school. But um, I'm assuming that uh, this person is an adult, so it is. Universities, a Universities. Universities sometimes have support for students. And would they have like a psychometrist? And uh, it's the psychometry that really costs, I think. Yeah. 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 Mm. It is a problem. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's interesting. It's unfortunate that there's that kind of, um, it's such a prevalent issue. And um, yeah, like, I like in what the, Terry in the says. Doc, is there any psychiatrists that you guys can recommend to listeners in the supporting document um, that we send out later? It's always so hard to find psychiatrists in the first place. Right. I can't okay. really. I knew one, but she didn't specialize in, in ADD. Um, okay. So, um, Does it, yeah. Do any of the people that are listening today know of a psychiatrist or can recommend one? If, if, you, if you can, if you could write it in the uh, comments box, that would be great. Um, and I see a comment here from Terry. One of the biggest learning points for me was realizing that I'm a mirror well, for, mm -hmm. for my family. I agree with that completely. Um, how I see her is reflected back to her. Changing to a more loving and caring way of treating her helped her accept herself more. Well, um, so I think this is in response to, I had asked everybody to share some strategies or things that have been helpful for them with this mm -hmm. topic because there's a lot of wisdom in the room. And, um, and this has been something that has been really helpful, helpful for her. Hmm. Deb would be the one to comment on that, I think. Oh, uh, no, I just, I agree. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, uh, similar to what I was saying about, um, you know, not judging the person and this, this laziness myth is just kind of seeing your daughter's pain and, um, letting her know that you love her no matter what, and that you will that you will support her, and asking her for what she needs, and she may not know. How old is your daughter, Terry? I don't think she. I think she's frozen. Um, yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, there you are again. <laughs> how How old is your daughter, Terry? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Sorry. I actually got cut off there. I've only just been able to get back on. Um, uh, is 12, just gone 12. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Celebrating, her, celebrating her strengths as well. You know, this mm. is yeah. the way it is with yeah. any child, of course, but focusing on, on strengths. Yeah. The other thing is puberty. You know, we didn't talk about that, but puberty yeah. and hormones also play a factor as well. So... Um, yeah, <laughs> Nina. Mm -hmm. um, and so that complicates uh, 
things as well. But I think for, for her to, to know that you're with her and that you love her and she, and you do, you think she's the bee's knees. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I like what, what Nina said as well, um, is that, that uh, try to be strength focused um, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's such a tough age anyway with self-esteem. So I don't know what happens for her at school. I don't know how her peers react to her. Um, it's tough, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and, and really what, what's most important is that she knows that you are there for her no matter what, and that you keep the communication open, that she can talk to you about anything and you want to hear what she has to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting you guys both really agree on strengths-focused um, communication. Um, I'm not sure, I think you could probably do a, a Google search on strengths-based communication and get, and get a whole bunch of tools and resources and strategies. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's anything that comes to mind, guys, just um, you can forward it. Yes. I'll make sure. Do you know, there's, yeah. there is a terrific institute. It's called the uh, VIA, V-I-A Institute in the States. And it has a youth strengths survey that's free for young people to complete between the age of 10 and 17. Oh. Um, and it's terrific. It's a really detailed survey and it throws back then this beautiful report showing their strengths um, oh. and it just yeah do it you could also do it for adults as well um, and I'm a huge fan uh, and it's had just had a really positive effect we've all done it in our house and um, so we all know um, each other's strengths and it's lovely because they don't um, of the 26 character strengths nothing is seen as a weakness it's all just a strength that hasn't been um, exercised yet mm -hmm. so you can turn I, I any that. one of those into yeah i need that for my adult clients that sounds great so there's an adult yeah version. there is perfect the, you know the, the thing about a strength based approach and this could be a whole workshop on, on itself but is to to make sure that it's that you use it so that's great for self-esteem knowing what your strengths are but when it comes to um, problem solving and um, conflict resolution, but particularly teaching young people how to problem solve. It's getting them to draw from their strengths um, to be able to do that. Um, you know, oh, well, what does that say about you when you did this? Um, like about their character and things like that. So that they, well, hang on, you've, this is one of your strengths. How do you think that you can use that in this situation? Because you're this and you're able to do this, you know, um, yeah, it, it can be used so effectively. So we have a few people that need to run. Um, so I just wanted to give gratitude to Nina, Deb, and to all of our participants today, um, and to all of our listeners who are listening in the future. Thank you for showing up for the conversations, for um, demonstrating vulnerability with with sharing what you're going through and uh, being honest about where you're at um, for suggesting tools and strategies. Um, it's been a really interesting hour and I, I really look forward to all of these conversations continuing uh, in each of your circles in the future. I hope you can continue to learn and develop. Um, and I'll definitely, uh, Nina and Deb and I are going to be putting together a supporting document for each of you so that you have access to some of the resources that they would recommend and also their contact information if you'd like to follow up and reach out to them personally. Um, I really recommend that you do so, even if it's just to ask some questions. Um, they're really approachable, friendly people, you know, they're, they're available, they're here for you. So uh, please, please continue uh, to grow and learn and be the best that you can be. And thanks a lot for, for joining the, the How We Heal series today.